I don't know about you guys, but I've been noticing a trend with nearly all forms of popular media within the last few years. Films and TV shows have always been made not for the intention of telling a good story, but for whatever can make the most money, and it's only getting more obvious. Gone are the days when you could have a film about giant dinosaurs running loose in a park, but the story is actually a cautionary tale about what happens when you monetize things you truly don't understand. Now it gets remade and rebooted with all the aesthetics of why people loved it, but with none of the heart of what the original had to say. It just gets muddied down by trendy story beats and whatever somebody else thinks would make a great trailer shot. Nowhere can this misunderstanding be more prominently shown than with superheroes. The medium of superheroes has been fairly malleable and can be made to fit whatever the author wants to try to convey. But what's baked into the heart of every superhero story should always be that they should, well, be heroic. Learning to take steps to improve their flaws, saving the innocent people around them, and inspiring the world around them. Yet, that's kind of rare these days. And judging by the superhero blockbusters that just focus on if the hero can outpunch the baddies, the rise of the anti-heroes, and the quote-unquote subversive takes on superheroes, now that that's the norm, I don't blame the internet discourse around people rediscovering Superman saving a young woman from jumping off a building, and then they're wondering why he didn't have anything else better to do with his time. Let me explain. So what does superhero media currently look like? Over on the Marvel side, the MCU started out small-scale throughout the early phases. Iron Man learns that there's more to life than being a rich playboy. Thor learns what it means to be a god and what it means to be worthy. Captain America's always had a good heart, but finally he has the means to do good. They all come together for the big climactic Avengers film, and the entire fight wasn't really about going against Loki. That bit ended hilariously quick. The actual coming together moment happened in response to how they were all going to save the people of Manhattan with what skills they had available. There are a hundred thousand aliens out there. And I killed 11 of them. You're welcome. <laughs> this was beautiful, and it's exactly what I mean when I say superheroes being heroic. Because the will the superhero save the day moment sticks with us far more than the will the hero stop the villain. Even in the next film, Iron Man 3, the scene where Tony is saving everyone on a crashing Air Force One sticks with me far more than the brawl against the fake Mandarin. I can even forgive the fake-out reveal that it was just an empty suit because it was such a well-paced action scene. And this is kind of where power scaling takes the wheel, and the average person in the world of the MCU just become an afterthought. Thor the Dark World jumps straight into the world-ending threats, and the franchise never really turns back. With a big blockbuster film, you need to raise the stakes, and where do you go from there? Sure, they evacuated the civilians in Age of Ultron, but that's just background noise to the real fight against Ultron. Even the supposedly street-level heroes do very little saving of street-level people. There aren't many moments of heroes saving people unless it involves someone very close to the hero they accidentally caused the problem to begin with. Or it's the very unspecific, the day that they saved. Hell, the entire plot of the Eternals is about how they stayed out of everyday problems, and then they end the film by staying out of everyday problems. It's kind of this way until at least Miss Marvel, and even that's kind of moved past after the newer Dimension stuff is introduced. The major exception, though, is Doctor Strange. Still holding true to his first do-no-harm of his Hippocratic Oath, Strange actually feels guilty for having to kill one of Caecilius's men, never mind that it was still in self-defense, and they're trying to destroy the world, but... Strange still feels bad. And that's been a defining character moment for Strange, and for a while, it makes him the only hero in any active franchise to go out of their way to keep up with the no-killing rule. He'd rather bargain with Dormammu. He'd rather banish Kaecilius to the Dark Dimension. And if you really think about it, even in Infinity War, out of all the 14 million possible futures that Strange saw, he just happened to pick the only one where they could win, with Thanos' army being defeated, everyone would come back, and he would do no unnecessary harm to the people that happened to kill half the universe. And as we've seen from literally every other universe's Thanos, he's actually a chump who can get killed brutally very easily. Strange probably saw a future where he just closed a portal around Thanos' head like Wong did to Cold Sidian's hand and end the fight right then and there, but that would have almost certainly caused countless problems down the road. The only way to truly win was to save the day definitively and heroically. And again, that's beautiful when you think about it. Except... Strange throws all of that out the window in No Way Home when Peter tells him an actual doctor, that he plans on curing the villains instead of letting them die, but Strange freaks out. But I guess that 
would be a very short movie if Strange was on board with the plan from the get-go. And then again, throughout the entire film, Strange relearned the lesson of do no harm, because he immediately shows up in Multiverse of Madness as the only version of any Doctor Strange who is willing to go to great lengths to save a little girl and not kill her to prevent Wanda from doing so. And I'm just saying, if you look at things this way, there's no possible way for Doctor Strange to have forgotten Peter Parker after the spell, but that's probably something that's never gonna get addressed, so... How has the DCEU handled things? Well... Okay, so the only moment where the heroes actually team up to save people was in the theatrical cut of Justice League. But then that town was abandoned in the Snyder Cut. Which makes it weird that the only actual heroic superheroes that go out of their way to save people in the DCEU were Wonder Woman whenever her guitar riff hits, or The Flash who puts babies in microwaves. And I guess it is a bit disingenuous if I don't mention how learning to be a hero by being something bigger than himself was the entire plot of The Batman, which ended with Bruce out there comforting people after the big climactic fight, and James Gunn's Superman legacy is said to be entirely about Superman being that kindness in a world that shuns it. So there is hope for DC moving forward. As for what we have for most of the DCEU, a good chunk of Marvel pre-MCU, and the entirety of the Sony Spider-Man less Spider-Verse, we have the dark and brooding anti-hero. I know it's kind of a controversial take, but anti-heroes are usually not that interesting to me. The history of anti-heroes is a topic for its own video, but they've always been around since Namor debuted in Marvel Comics number no. 1 back in 1939, and have usually come and gone in waves that mirror the real world's countercultural movements of their time. Batman grew out of the desire to be rougher with the enemies during World War II, the Brotherhood of Mutants during the Civil Rights Movement, V for Vendetta and the British era of Thatcherism, but then things took a major leap with the 90s extreme counterculture movement. But hey, those come sold well and there's no need to examine closely whether they sold because the fans genuinely like these characters or, you know, the speculation bubble hadn't burst yet. My main problem with anti-heroes is that by and large there usually is not much character development. They're already the hardcore killing machine before the series starts. Everything is made to make cool action figures and often they're still made with that PG-13 tone. Edgy enough that the boys will eat it up but not too graphic that their moms will boycott it. It all comes off less like a drill sergeant who's eloquently telling you the places they'll shove their boots, and more like a teenager screaming obscenities while playing Call of Duty. But above all, it's rare to have any of these moments that make us want to cheer for the anti-hero. They're just cool to sell a product, not tell an actual story. With the rise of the superhero films in the 2000s, nearly all of them, except for Raimi's Spider-Man films, where Superman Returns were all anti-hero focused. The stakes of the films don't usually revolve around actually trying to protect the people, just stop the bad guy and maybe make a few cool trailer shots. Even the X-Men films are kind of guilty of this, choosing to focus on the too cool for school Wolverine rather than the rest of the team. It wasn't until three whole Wolverine solo films later when they finally realized that Logan would work so much better if he was just trying to save one little girl, Laura, so the audience can now be grounded with some kind of stakes as to what's happening, instead of wondering if the unkillable death machine can stab the CGI villain enough times. How it got this way isn't some big industry secret, it's the money. If something makes money, make more of it. If something makes a lot of money, expand to other mediums. If someone else makes a lot of money and you didn't, peek at their homework and try to guess what they wrote down. For every Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons Watchmen, which is a nuanced look at both the good and ugly of the superhero world, we get a corporate cash grab that copies the aesthetics, but doesn't give a single layer deeper to analyze why people were drawn to the original. Hey guys, Editing Eric here. I had a several minutes long section planned about Watchmen and how the glorification of anti-heroes like Rorschach is actually horrible when all the clippy one-liners we get really do diminish the horrors of the real-world examples of violent vigilantes committing acts of terror against an entire population based entirely on race. But I don't feel like I'm equipped enough to lead a discussion on that important, yet gruesome topic. And I don't think I have the mental bandwidth either to sift through all those negative comments. So yeah. Racism is bad. Vigilantes in the real world are bad. And Rorschach is bad. I can't believe I need to say this, but he's not supposed to be the voice of reason in the novels. The dude's an actual clansman. Whatever. Let's just jump ahead to the things aren't all that bad section. 
I will admit, though, that the anti-hero has been handled a lot better in recent years after Logan. Peacemaker was perfect as a TV show, but that's because the entire show wasn't about him trying to stop the alien butterflies. It was about self-reflection. Peacemaker starts off as a one-dimensional, gun-toting badass who needs to confront why he is this way, and the entire trope as a result of it. And by the end of the series, sure, he doesn't exactly go full Boy Scout, but he's now more likable than nearly everyone else in the DC Extended Universe. The Boys television series does a great job specifically focusing on the moments that separate it from the rest of the superhero genre, with very specific callbacks to when heroes were heroic in the comics, and showing the villains deliberately choosing the opposite. My Adventures with Superman stays true to who Clark Kent is supposed to be, just set in a world that doesn't immediately acknowledge him as a pure-hearted savior, or in my opinion, the finest superhero story told in recent years, Invincible. It can have all the over-the-top brutality to draw on the viewers, and it can have the commentary on how superheroes would be in the real world, because it put the legwork in to give us a protagonist who we actually believe is trying to be a hero. Where other projects would just give a quick moment to address the innocent bystander body count of their climactic fight scenes, it's always in later films several years afterwards. But we get an entire season of Mark trying to learn to be a hero, struggle along the way, and then get in way over his head when he bites his dad in Chicago. Going into the fight, we know that there's literally no possible way that Invincible can beat Omni-Man. He's going against a centuries-year-old immortal warfighter, and Mark just barely learned to fly a few episodes ago. And we know that Omni-Man isn't going to kill his son. We can see that he's going easy on him and just playing with Mark until he can try to turn him to his side. What Mark loses in this fight is his hope his optimism, as his dad is literally using him as a weapon to kill the very people he's trying to protect. And it's brutal. If the recent shift to the less heroic superhero media has done anything, it's made us desensitized to all the cartoonish violence that these characters have done, and we haven't been made to care about any of it. This scene affects us so much because we're finally seeing our protagonists be affected by it. It's not random gratuitous violence that some exec thought was a trend that needed to be jumped on. It's actually telling us more about Invincible as a hero, and we don't need to see him brood over some city skyline to get us there. But what do you guys think? What's that one super heroic moment that's always stuck with you? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this week's video, please hit that like button and subscribe for more weekly content on comic books and nerd stuff. I've been Eric, and you've been awesome.